Welcome to the Ohio Chamber of Commerce's Elected Official Series. I'm Steve Stivers, President and CEO of the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, and I'm pleased today to have Senate President Matt Huffman with us. Hi. Welcome, Senator. Great to be here, uh, Steve, and appreciate, of course, the great work the Chamber does uh, throughout the state of Ohio. Well, we appreciate all your great service. Uh, tell us, there's another round of ARPA dollars coming soon. Sure. What yeah. can you tell us about the process, the type of projects that would likely be funded, and the priorities that public policymakers are setting around making sure those dollars get maximum impact and don't cause us to maybe pay higher taxes later by sure. uh, funding programs that would you'd have to find funding for on an ongoing basis. Do you have criteria or priorities, or what can you tell us about the process? Yeah, and, and that's a great point. What we don't want to do is create an expectation of a service in the state of Ohio that ultimately we can't uh, support in the long term, even e either at, on a local basis or statewide basis. And uh, we there's actually about $400 million of the previous ARPA money that came in that still needs to be allocated. But next month, in, in May of 22, we'll get a uh, get a check from the federal government for $2.7 billion, billion with a B. And I think it's been the governor's uh, priority in my meetings with him and along with the speaker that uh, we uh, identify projects that are going to be the kinds of projects that have been long-term systemic, mostly physical or capital projects. Um, and you know, we of course have ongoing revenue for a lot of capital projects like road building and, and bridges and things like that. But you know, one example is our, uh, for example, water management, especially in Southeast Ohio. Uh, we had a history of uh, coal mining in Southeast Ohio. And many years ago, there weren't the kind of environmental regulations there are now. And a lot of those communities simply cannot pay for the cleanup of some of those uh, sites. And uh, that those sites, those kinds of sites, and it's not just in Southeast Ohio, and it's not just coal mining for that matter. Um, you know, those, those are in the billions of dollars. So even those projects need to be prioritized. If you get in other places, there's a big enough population where through, um, uh, you know, the appropriate fee structure, you can pay for these things. But in some places, um, that's just not possible. Um, so there are those kinds of projects. There are other kinds of, of um, capital projects that we haven't been able to, to fund even through our normal capital bud budget uh, uh, funding process. One of the things that we did with the education uh, COVID dollars, a little bit off topic, is creating um, some, especially in, in, in a time period where children missed a lot of school, we, uh, we created um, essentially a scholarship program for uh, lower income uh, children from lower income families, $500 a year where they could get extra tutoring and attend camps and things like that. So we want to be inventive, um, but the ideas to do those kinds of things don't just emanate in here in Capitol Square. Those come from all over the state. So, you know, I would urge, you know, your members and members of the public uh, to get with their legislator and talk to about things that, hey, you know, here's a long term problem that we've had in this particular and it, part of the state or in our community. Um, and, you know, I, I have um, city of Lima, for example, is an older city. Uh, it's about 180 years old. And there are a lot of very old buildings that frankly, the city of Lima, I was on city council for 15 years, didn't have the ability uh, to take those buildings down. And there are brownfield sites. So we've allocated some of the money in the past to that. And I think that's very important. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different kinds of ideas. And we are by no means have that money spent and planned. So we need to hear from the public. Thanks, Mr. President. I, I appreciate your great fiscal stewardship around that money. Uh, because we uh, do want to make sure that money right. is spent to the maximum impact, but we also want to make sure that it doesn't doesn't uh, set up a problem where taxes might have to be raised later. Uh, the number one problem we hear from businesses around Ohio is around workforce. And would you guys be open to some kind of creative ideas about getting people to either move to Ohio or do something with workforce on those dollars? Or do you see that as an ongoing expense that you try to avoid? 
Well, I, I, I think the latter, if, if those were, you know, kind of the two choices we're looking at. But I, I would take it a little bit further that some of the long-term policies that, that are de- dealing with workforce are really a matter of policies that we have adopted in the state of Ohio. And frankly, a lot of other states have. There need to be changes in those policies. It's not simply a matter of cash. Um, you know, we heard recently, well, the price of gas went up. And so one answer in California was, we'll give everybody a gas card. Well, that takes care of them for a couple of weeks. The real price is the supply and demand structure of oil and gas. It doesn't solve the problem. So we do need to make changes in our public benefit structure to make sure that the money is going to those who truly need it. Sure. It doesn't disincentivize people from working. Um, we need to show people the, the benefit of, of uh, going directly into the workforce after high school. Uh, and how that's a better financial decision um, in, in, in many regards. Now, um, I don't think people are opposed to a one-time thing where, um, hey, if we, uh, you know, Intel, of course, is a great example, but um, where people say, hey, I'm going to relocate to Ohio because of this great economic opportunity. Um, but, you know, things like changes in public benefits, making it easier for businesses to be successful, uh, especially startup businesses, maybe minority businesses in, in urban areas. That's one of the most difficult things I think uh, we have with getting those businesses started. Um, I had a question a couple of weeks ago uh, from some folks in Cleveland about it's a grocery store closed in the last um, grocery store in a particular area. What can the state do to do something about it? Well, no matter what the state does, if there's not an individual or a family, a group of people who can be financially successful without the government's help, it's never going to be a permanent uh, operation. There's yeah. never going to be wealth uh, that grows in that family and is transferred to the next generation. And to do that, the government has to make it easier, not harder, for businesses to be successful. And I think that's how you get people to come here. Uh, The business income tax deduction was a great example of that. Um, And um, so it's really a matter of long-term policies rather than one-time money. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. And on behalf of our 318,000 businesses in Ohio, I want to thank you for your leadership in the last state budget on trying to do something with the benefits, Cliff. You know, Lima, Allen County, your home community has been a leader on that. Uh, you took some language that uh, allows that to be exported throughout the state. Yeah. Uh, we're excited about that. We hope that that will mean people will have an incentive to work mm-hmm. as opposed to uh, just get benefits. And uh, we think the benefit cliff uh, is one of those things that uh, should be dealt with. And I really appreciate your leadership on it. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, we we create programs from time to time in budgets because we see a particular need and then they continue to exist. And when we try to change it, people who, for whatever reason, are running that program, they think it's going to be devastating. And I think my main point is that, you know, we talk a lot about our, our constitutional freedoms, the right to free speech and the right to vote and redress your government, all of these things. But you're never, in my, in my mind, you're never truly free until you are financially free, until you do not need to rely on the government. You do not need to rely even on your employer. You can take your labor and take it someplace else or start your own business. And once you're financially free, then you can decide for your family, yourself, whatever it is, where you're going to live and what you want to do and what you want to do for your children and all of that. So that's that's true freedom. And the easier we make it for people to rely on the government, the harder it is for those people to be free. That's a great point. As Senate president, you're leader of the Republican caucus in the Senate. Are there any particular races that our business people should be watching or helping with? What, tell me about the 2022 elections. Well, yeah, so it's, it's, um, in, in the Senate, as I'll speak only uh, about the Senate, as you asked. So there's 33 cent, uh, Senate seats and, and every two years there are, um, half, in this case, not quite half, 16 seats are up, or 17, excuse me, are up for election. Uh, Seven of those seats are held by Democrats, 10 are held by Republicans right now. Um, So it's a pretty even year in terms of of that. Um, We have uh, 
just uh, one of our incumbents, I think, is in a in a difficult district. And you know, as soon as I say that, there's something happens. And a difficult district isn't just the district; it really has a lot more to do with who's running against you and how good is their campaign. But um, certainly, I think Nathan Manning is is uh, uh, sort of at the top of our uh, priority list, uh, along with Christina Rogner, who are incumbents who are in tougher districts, say, than mine, which is very Republican, or, or Rob McCauley out in Western Ohio. So we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on those races. We have some other races where we're going to be challenging um, some of the Democrats. Uh, one of the seats that we're very um, excited about is um, Michelle Reynolds is our candidate. She's going to be running in the third here in the Senate Ohio district. Third district in yeah, Franklin here, County. here in Franklin yeah. County. Michelle's a great candidate. Um, uh, up until February 1st, she ran uh, Governor DeWine's faith-based ministries program. But beyond that, she's, she's a, a pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, school choice uh, businesswoman who's had a, a great deal of experience in business, particularly in, in running businesses which rehabilitate folks, get them out of the criminal justice system and get them into the work what I was talking about, about getting people financially free. So she's going to bring expertise to our caucus and to the Senate on how to do that. So, so that's a um, race to watch. Ohio yeah, yeah. Three. And, and she's, district, she's a sure. great candidate, a lot of charisma. Um, you know, I met her for the first time uh, last fall. And there were other candidates interested, uh, but ultimately we thought uh, she, you know, Michelle would be fantastic. And, you know, we look, look forward to uh, working on that race. Great. Well, uh, you know, in 2015, speaking of races and districts, the voters uh, approved a new process for redistricting. Sure. Uh, it's proven to be frustrating for many Ohioans. Uh, the Supreme Court now for the fourth time has uh, said no. Yeah. Um, is there a way forward on districts? And do you expect to see any changes in the process? Uh, what What do you think is about to happen? Hopefully we're going to have districts soon. Uh, it's been frustrating to a lot of people who want to know what's going on with their sure. state house and state senator and who they might be and what their districts might look like. Yeah, well, if, if there was a person who was at the top of the list being most frustrated, it would be me. Uh, I don't know how many people remember this, but in, back in the end of 2014, I, I actually drafted, and of course it was amended several times, uh, but uh, ultimately was the sponsor of the constitutional amendment that went on the ballot in 2015. And uh, it was, you know, the, the, the basic concept of this was we are going to make sure that communities weren't divided as much and that um, ultimately the majority would have an incentive to get the minority buy-in majority party uh, by uh, working with them. And if they didn't, they couldn't have their 10-year map. And all of the restrictive rules had to be followed. And there was a penalty for not doing that, which meant if you didn't do that, then you had to draw the map according to proportionality. And that that was the constitutional amendment. In fact, uh, Kathleen Clyde, who is in the House of Representatives, made a speech pointing that out, that that proportionality was only aspirational. I also made a speech about that. And that helped both the Republicans and Democrats support this. And that's why it passed overwhelmingly. Well, the Supreme Court chose to make the aspirational part mandatory in their decision. And I was disappointed, frankly, a year ago when we knew that the census data was going to be late. The Constitution requires us to pass these maps by September 15th in the year ending in one, so last year. When that, uh, we were informed in April that we wouldn't be receiving the census data until September 27th at the time, and we need a few weeks after that to put it all in the data that we needed to draw maps, I asked the other three caucus members we met, and I said, we need to, to extend this out 60 days so we have time to negotiate and draw the map. Well, the uh, groups basically working with the Democratic Party, the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, and others objected to having additional time to work it out, even though we were the census data was going to be late, which to me at the time was astonishing. And of course, what happened was we ultimately got the date, the, the data by the about the beginning of September and just had two weeks. And we drew a map that, I, in my opinion, is constitutional. 
And unfortunately, the Supreme Court didn't make a decision about that and for about four months until just before the filing deadline. We had just, I think, 10 or 11 days to draw a new map. And we passed that. We only had 10 or 11 days. We only had 10 or 11. So it was the same process four times. And I'm, you know, my, my biggest frustration here is, is that the negotiation between what do you want in order for us to give you so that we can get a 10-year map, that never happened. There, there was never any give and take. It was all, this is what we want. Well, we're not going to pass that, but how about if you do this? There, there was never any true negotiation. So that, that's been extraordinarily frustrating uh, for me. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of folks say, well, you should just completely scrap this process. Well, one of the provisions that, that is in this reform that is not present, present in most con state constitutions is the, um, the requirement that the Supreme Court cannot draw a map in the state of Ohio. Not true in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, a lot of places where they're having a bigger fight than we're having, believe it or not, right now. And um, so I think that's important because I think this is a legislative matter. It's not a matter for the courts to decide. Um, I should also say we could have this problem without a map, uh, even if the Supreme Court, it never went to the Supreme Court. You have to have four people to agree on something. Sure. And believe it or not, Republicans don't always agree, especially Republicans in the House and Senate and statewide office holders and things like that. So it has been frustrating. I'm hoping that it's going to get resolved here uh, one way or another. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a primary on August 2nd and um, go from there. Great. Well, we already talked a little bit about workforce. The chamber was a big proponent of increasing the funding for tech cred, which you did in the budget last year by $50 million. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, tech Cred's a great program. It's a model program. In fact, Kevin Boehner from the chamber here uh, spoke in Missouri because they're looking at taking that model. Uh, other than Tech Cred, what other things do you have on the horizon uh, to sort of reform workforce efforts in Ohio to make sure employers get access to people with the skills they need? Well, I, I think there, so. There's sort of three. Um, areas like we talked a little bit about the, the public benefits mm -hmm. uh, problem, the benefits cliff. We've tried to address that. Um, the federal government has lowered the age to become eligible for Medicaid for otherwise people who could be working and are otherwise healthy with no other restrictions from 64 to 54. So that took out a large swath of folks who said, if I have medical coverage, I'm not going to work. And so that that's a problem, and it's a problem that the federal government. Uh, but created. there are a lot of yeah, they create, and, it, and it's there's a lot of other problems. I mean, you know, 50 years ago, um, there were one percent of the people, the population, were on Social Security disability. Now it's five percent, despite all the money we've spent on medical care. There's more people on medical disability, and if it's easier to get that, um, that's a problem. So. I can give you a lot of other uh, problems on the benefits side. The second uh, area that I would talk about is the area of criminal justice reform. It's very popular for legislators to say, I want to be tough on crime. There's a tragedy. We're going to increase the, um, uh, the punishment for a particular crime. I don't think most people in the public know what punishment there are for crimes, but in the moment, it, legislators want to make it worse than it was before. And in many cases, that's true. And of course, the job of the government, the first job of the government is the protection okay. of the public. Sure. But what we have created in the last 30 to 40 years is a criminal justice system which puts people in essentially a permanent state of being unable to work through collateral sanctions, through um, it's almost impossible to truly seal a record now. We don't have, we have almost no ability to expunge and those two things are different. I don't think even most people in the criminal justice system realize that. Um, and you know, there's 38 ways to lose your driver's license in the right. state of Ohio. Uh, we have accumulating fines and fees in municipal courts, which you, people can't pay to get their license back. So all of those things have created a group of people who say, hey, it's so hard to get to the point where I can get a job that I can pay because of all of these problems. They'd rather participate in either 
some other criminal activity or a public benefit system or have a family member who does. So that needs to be reformed, and we've, we've been working on that in a, in a considerable way. Uh, we're doing that right now with a, a reform bill in, in the Judiciary Committee in the, sen in the Senate. The third thing I would say is, and we talked about the tech cred, um, this is also something that's been created essentially in the last 50 years or so in our uh, society, really, nationwide, is that we, we have assumed and we, we have, and, and it's certainly parents of children, but guidance counselors and other people in the public, that the way to be, the only way to be successful College. is to go to university. And now, because everyone can borrow money to do that, Student loan debt. Yeah, student loan debt. And so people are graduating. They owe tens of thousands of dollars. They have a degree which doesn't make them any more marketable than they did when they got out of high school. And um, it, it's a huge, huge problem. And I we've addressed some of that with Senate Bill 135. Um, but there's much more. And it really is the responsibility of the universities to do this. I've been talking to him about 15 years about this. So I'm not sure that that's going to happen. But allowing people to uh, see that there are these jobs that are available to them through a community college, through some other training, that's not even necessarily at a college. It may be through an employer, through a union, something like that. Just one quick example. I toured um, community college up in Lake County. They have a, a great dentist uh, dental hygienist program. They have 36 spots each year, and it's completely full in the first year and the second year. The second year are graduating. Everyone gets a job making between seventy dollars and $80,000 a year with no student debt. Now, they can't say that they've got a BA in history and a minor in political science, and they went to Ohio State or whatever, but they can say, I have no debt and I can afford to pay my bills, get married, start a family. And if you can still read history books and political science books, even if you didn't go to college, Steve, by the way. So um, I think we need to enable that. I'm not telling, I'm not saying discourage people from going to college, but we have to stop saying this is the best path for you if you want to be successful. Sure. No, that's uh, really uh, great thought and advice. And we've got to I think transform our K through 12 system. Right. It's focused on serving only the kids who go to college. We've got to make sure it serves all kids. And mm -hmm. uh, the chamber is a big proponent of creating some type of connector. We think maybe um, you know a, a nonprofit, but we haven't figured it out yet. That connects our 318,000 employers to the 60,000 kids every year that graduate high school, half of whom don't go on to college, uh, to try to make sure and try to connect them while they're in school to get that work experience sure. while they're a sophomore and a junior and connect with an employer so that they can enter the workforce. Um, we, we think that's really important right. for our employers, but also for the 50,000 kids that are graduating from Ohio uh, high schools every year in Ohio. So that's an exciting opportunity. I think we'll, we got a lot of work to do yeah. to make our workforce ready for the jobs of the future. It's great to have great leaders like you focusing on that and a lot of other issues. Just one last question. Um, as you look at the balance of the legislative session between now and December, mm -hmm. what are your top priorities? What do you expect to be addressed? And how much time do you expect the legislature to be in, given that there'll be campaigns and districts and primary and a general election that haven't happened yet for legislators? How much time will they be in and what will the top issues be? Yeah, I think we'll be uh, here through the first week in June, that, and basically the calendar that we have now in the Senate, and then uh, we'll come back after the general election. So, so likely not for those uh, basically four or five months in between uh, the end of June and the beginning of November, or the beginning of June and the end of November. Um, and so, so we, of course, have our capital budget. Uh, we would like to get that done uh, by before we leave for the summer. I think a lot of people are trying to plan their projects. In some cases, the expectation that it's going to be done, there, there's always problems with timing of some projects and things like that. Um, I mentioned the criminal justice reform bill, which really has been uh, is a conglomeration of several bills over the last three or four general assemblies. And um, 
I think that's something that we want to get done before the end of this year, because as I said, there are people simply uh, in a position where it's, it's, it's almost impractical to go to work uh, and to go through all of the problems, or it, it, if they can even do it. So we have to remove those uh, obstacles. A, um, a brave group of legislators in the Senate have uh, agreed to serve on a, a committee to begin trying to resolve the problems that we have with the unemployment compensation system. And that committee is going to be meeting um, throughout this year to talk about it. And um, probably, I probably don't need to tell your members or most of the most of the public what the problem is. There's I mean, a lot it's, of fraud in the system, at least last year. Well, the, yeah, there's a lot of fraud. There's no question about that, especially during and, and where there's an opportunity. Uh, no matter how safe your system is, somebody's going to take advantage of that. But but the bigger problem is the the longer term problem. The the unemployment compensation program is an insurance program the state of Ohio runs. It's insolvent. Right. right. Well, not only is it insolvent, but about every 10 years, it's insolvent, which right. if that was an insurance company that had a license from the state of Ohio, we wouldn't let them sell insurance anymore in the state of Ohio, right? Because they couldn't pay their claims. So, um, you know, there's, there's always, there's really three parts to an insurance uh, program. One is uh, the premiums that are paid. The middle part is the management of the system and how that's done. And then, of course, benefits. the final layer, the benefits. And there needs to be uh, a, a view of all three of those things by people who are experienced and been through this. And, and I think in the Senate, we have, you know, half a dozen senators or so um, through their legislative experience or business experience have an idea. So we're going to try to uh, at least come up with a plan, uh, and I'm sure your members would be interested in that. And we have an expectation that you and your staff here at the chamber are going to uh, weigh in on that. Um, and, and of course, there there are um, there there are a number of other bills. I, the, the one thing that I wanted to mention was uh, Terry Johnson, uh, of course, as we know, is a doctor down in Scioto County, and even though we have exposed in many ways the problems with the opioid epidemic, the, the drug problem, especially in, in rural Ohio, not just in rural Ohio, but that's where Terry's from, um, has not gone away. And in fact, in many ways, it is today worse than it ever was, not because of uh, prescriptions of otherwise legal drugs, but because of the fentanyl problem. So, um, we had a discussion about a bill uh, the other day about whether Narcan should be supplied or, or getting funding for Narcan, and uh, which, of course, is the drug that if someone's overdosing, it essentially saves their lives. And one of our senators mentioned their son was a, um, a, a EMT, and he actually would has been going to the same house over and over, sometimes the same house for the same person twice in one day to give them Narcan. So, and we talked about, well, you know, how much funding do we do for Narcan? And, and, you know, that's sort of that moral, you know, discussion you have to have. And there are some people who push back against that. But the point was made, it doesn't make any difference how much we do. If there are um, the, the kind of cross-border activity in Mexico with fentanyl that there is like there, there's no way we're simply going to be able to shut this down until the border yeah. is secured. And it, it's, of course, is a federal government problem. This administration has a different uh, attitude than the last administration. Um, and uh, But it's also a state problem because it obviously makes its way to Ohio. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to have to deal with that through law enforcement mechanisms, through a whole number of other mechanisms. So, Terry has talked about, and, and we're going to, the Senate will be announcing a, a, a select committee to talk about how we begin to address that in communities with law enforcement, with the other social services. Uh, you know, fentanyl is, is a different, um, it's a different game because it, it rewires how the brain works I people think. in a permanent way. So that's another thing that we're going to be working on in the Senate. Um, a lot of other things in Hopper, short time to do it. And unfortunately, the redistricting part has taken Speaker Cup and I out of uh, a lot of the policy decisions that had to get made in the last three months. Uh, so we'll be sort of back in the game here for the next couple months and, and try to get a few things done. Well, it's 
really important priorities. We wish you luck on all those things. The chamber obviously will be engaging in yeah. a lot of those issues. Thanks for your leadership and thanks for coming on our show.